everyone. Welcome to a virtual Factory Berlin. My name is Charlotte Hook. I'm one of the events programming managers here. Um, and we are very happy to have you at this event. It's a super special one. I'm sure we'll have a lot to learn. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Factory Berlin, if you haven't heard of us before. So Factory Berlin um, is a diverse community of over 3,000 creators and innovators. Um, we bring together startups, solopreneurs, corporates, creative ex experts, um, and we bring together the most ambitious, creative, entrepreneurial individuals who support and empower each other's work. We do that in a couple of different ways. Um, so we empower our members by acting as a platform for them to connect and network and work together. We have a digital platform which allows them to connect online. And we have two physical spaces in Berlin, one in Kreuzberg and one in Mitte where they can meet in person. Um, we also have our events program which allows people to um, connect over content um, and learn more um, together. So we're on that note, we're super excited to have this event tonight. Um, we are welcoming um, Hanno Renner, who is the co-founder and CEO of Personio to the stage. Um, Personio is the HR software which helps SMEs and startups um, digitize their work um, so that they can focus on what's really important, which is, of course, people. Um, so they are a Munich-based startup. Since they founded four years ago, they've raised 130 mil. Um, inc incredible, very impressive. Um, and so we will have a lot to learn about um, how they've scaled their company as well. Um, this conversation will be moderated by Jenny Potevils. Um, she is the co-founder and managing director at um, at Leapsum, I'm sorry, <laughs> at Leapsum, which is a platform for performance market, um, performance management um, and employee engagement. Um, so with that, uh, we'll pass the microphone off to Jenny um, for her to get the conversation started. Hi, Jenny. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte, for these introductions. Um, I think Hannah and me, we already chatted before we started uh, the live, uh, at least live stream here. Very excited to be here today and uh, to have this conversation. So thanks all for joining and thanks, uh, Charlotte, for the kind introduction. So um, we've heard a couple of these really impressive numbers, Hanno, now on um, the success uh, and your sort of like story over the last sort of roughly five years. We, what I'd love to ask is actually to share the founding story behind uh, Personio with us, just to give everyone a bit more context how you guys got started and how it all evolved up to here. Yeah, happy to share some of that. But first of all, thanks, Jenny, and uh, thanks to Factory, uh, Factory Berlin. Great to be here, or be here virtually. Um, yeah, on Personio, essentially, um, I think the, the, the motivation behind founding Personio uh, came by two reasons. We met each other um, at, during university, UTM, which we did next to our studies. A very from different backgrounds come together. I was studying industrial engineering, so um, you know, computer scientists, and uh, then we got together. And essentially, we were motivated by by two things. One, uh, for all the study jobs we had, we never really worked in companies inspired and motivated as much as we were in the CDTM program and the pro projects that we did together working with other smart and motivated people. So there was the space and a company that was essentially like working in these programs at CDTM. Uh, we wanted to uh, build a company that actually not just finds a way to make money, but actually solves a real need and a problem for, for actually users. And um, I think that uh, was what was driving us when we uh, were, were working on a couple of projects also prior to Personio. And what's HR and Personio, uh, despite never in a, in a real job uh, before, um, we had a friend of us that also was in the CTM program that had, was CTO at a, of a, at a company of 100 people at the time. And they had the same problem as many SMEs back then, but still today have, that they're managing all their employees in uh, Excel spreadsheets and then pen and paper because there were no new solutions for them in place. But also, uh, I think HR was just a, a topic that was heavily underinvested, especially in the SME. And that's how we kind of learned about the problem. And then we initially just wanted to build a a tool that would digitize these Excel sheets so on people data by many people within the organization. And um, then when we built this first product and actually found 
Now, if we found early users that were paying for a product and gave a lot of feedback, we learned that there's much more than just this collaboration around the HR data, and hence how we, over the last couple of years, expanded towards what we today call the HR operating system and really try to cover the entire life cycle of people in organizations. Great. Uh, thanks for sharing it. Sounds like a really um, amazing journey and um, I'd love to hear about more also like a bit later about that sort of like diverse team um, that founded the company together. Maybe um, as a question because a lot of like startups focus on like the big money, the big enterprises and you decided to focus um, on SMEs. I think Personia's main focus is companies with 50 to 2,000 employees. So why that focus on SMEs and um, have the pain points you saw back then actually shifted nowadays? Yeah. Um, so I think the exciting part with um, technology and also software as a service um, over the last 10, 15 years is that it has enabled uh, to solve problems that were that were used to be solved by, by only SAP and so on uh, uh, in a much cheaper and much more affordable way and a much more user-friendly way where you didn't need to uh, have an uh, integration person and an internal office IT uh, to or IT manager to to build uh, your stack and that's uh, that has sort of I think democratized I've, I've once read an article where it called, they called it democratization uh, of software where it made it uh, possible to, to even build uh, such software that, that's possible, uh, that's affordable and, and usable by these companies. So essentially, uh, we were really excited by this uh, fact uh, that we could bring an innovation that had slowly, surely grown in the, in the enterprise over the last uh, 20 years. So SAP founded in, in the 70s, but then HR, the HR module started in the 90s. Then Workday brought it into the cloud in, in 2006, but still all focused on enterprise. But then uh, 10 years later, uh, this opportunity of, of moving things um, towards the SME um, was really exciting for us. At the same uh, time, also from the pure impact perspective, SME is the, from a number of employees the, the largest market in, in Europe. So there's 1.7 million uh, SMEs and, and hundreds of millions of, of people working in these SMEs and hence the impact we can have uh, on the people that are, work directly with the uh, software but also the ones that more indirectly request a vacation and so on is just immense and hence we were excited about solving this big problem. Yeah, very cool. And I think there's a lot of things you said that really resonates with, with us as well. You said you want, to re, uh, you want to solve a real problem or you saw that real problem you could solve for SMEs by democratizing that technology that was maybe probably not available to them. So that sounds very exciting. And you also initially said when you were t uh, talking about your founding story that you actually had um, fairly early on paying customers. And yet you did then obviously decide to uh, go for sort of like the VC money um, after I think roughly like a year of bootstrapping. So what was your rationale for them? And then I'd love to actually speak about that crazy sort of like uh, gross um, curve you've been on. So maybe just quickly your rationale and then we'll jump into that scaling aspect. Yeah. So I think, first of all, um, and uh, of course appreciate the, the kind words and the introduction, but I would never... Uh, use the, the 130 million we raised as in any way an achievement because I think neither funding rounds or the amount of money uh, shows in any way uh, whether you're, you're successful. I mean, we you know companies like WeWork that uh, raised a ton of money and then uh, might not ever. Uh, 2,000 customers is fairly uh, like a good K KPI though. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I much, I much rather talk about the customers we, we impact yes. and, how, uh, and how we make them happy and how we continue to strive to improve them rather than um, talking about money, uh, the money we raised as a measure for success. That said, um, to your question, uh, yes, we were bootstrap and we were lucky that early on customers trusted into us uh, with our initial solution and then we, we were able to, to expand and hire people and grow uh, organically or uh, based on um, you know, bootstrap. And uh, the reason we decided to, to raise money at that point in 2016 was and we felt we were at a point where we were growing, uh, but, but we always had a limitation on how fast we could develop our product further, how fast we can further uh, get to more customers and therefore improve, improve the impact. So I'm, I'm never saying that the VC funded startup is better than, than non-VC funded, but the likelihood that you can have as much impact with a, with a bootstrap company over time is just um, 
it's just harder. Some companies manage uh, to completely do it, but we realized that uh, it uh, we always had to hire, um, get two, three, four new customers until we could hire the next person uh, that could then develop in the product, and especially as a SaaS solution where you're building one product that impacts a ton of customers. If you are able to uh, to quicker get a better product, you can have more impact, which then impacts the number of customers you can acquire, and so on. And that that just sort of sorts uh, leads to this acceleration, and that's why we then in 2016 decided to raise our first seed round uh, to be able to invest uh, f- uh, more uh, in our product, and hence uh, yeah, drive this uh, and uh, invest a bit ahead of the curve. And um, yeah, and that's how, how we still over time always made these investment decisions. Not because money was available, but because we felt we could do something different or quicker or it enables us to have in some way, shape or form a bigger impact on our customers and on the market. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for sharing that. And um, I think we first met, um, maybe as a side note for people uh, watching us, we have an active partnership with Personio, so Leaps and uh, Personio Integrated. And I think we first met in your office, I think it was Buttermilcherstraße or something like that, with I think you guys were being roughly like 50 people and i think that was sort of like the growth that came out of your seed round from like 50 uh, 5 to 50 in roughly 12 months so that actually really does sound like a crash course in scaling a company so do you mind sharing like how can a fan, uh, like a founder design a scaling organization yeah so i think there's there's a few things and they're all super obvious or, or sound super obvious but but they matter a lot and I think it's, um, and, and we were lucky enough that we learned, um, you know, and we had in our first uh, investment round, our seed round, we had a, a VC and a couple of angel investors, and uh, some of them were, were the founders of Stylight, now founders of Alasco, that had just sold their company, and hence one had t- money to invest, but two also some time to, to actually share us their condensed learning over seven years uh, scaling Skylight. Uh, we were lucky enough to get from them uh, we implemented from the beginning on where things like um, that we always were trying to be a bit ahead of of where we where we would be so doing things before you get into the pain points and before you actually realize that, uh, that they're, they're struggling and that's why i wouldn't say we never had any pain points but we definitely were able to avoid a few and while this is quite high level i'll give you a few examples um i think number one is and you just touched on this is uh, designing as an organization and designing an organization early based not based on what you currently do and what everyone is doing but what do you need to to fulfill for your core purpose so we back in 2016 already and designed our or defined what our core purpose is which still is enabling better organizations we don't have strategic vision and a hack, and then we discussed uh, over a weekend what do we need in order to fulfill this purpose and what kind of teams do we have. And then we essentially designed, like had a, a customer journey so along the customer life cycle and designed what are the different steps we need to do there. So generating leads, converting them into customers, um, uh, maximizing their success with the product and so on. And, so, uh, and then of course, some of these teams we decided uh, designed there had um, um, have ob- or have gathered, gotten obvious names like marketing and sales and so on. But the difference was that we had a very clear definition of their mission uh, from the beginning on. And even if uh, one mission essentially was only owned by one person or partially even I owned uh, a couple of missions in the beginning, but that that made it very easy then when we hired people uh, to structure that into the organization. And still today, whenever we realize we have tasks that don't fit into a mission, we, uh, we either extend the mission or we create a new one within the sub teams and uh, still today within for, for example, customer success, where they're maximizing customer success is the submission. There's a ton of sub teams that have different individual missions, and uh, this also goes down to the individual role at level. And I think we're quite extensive on that, and you don't have to be as extensive, but I think just really thinking through what you need and then uh, scaling to that helps you massively to get clarity on who is responsible for what. And, um, and that's sort of just on the, your direct question in regards to organization. Two quick other examples that go in the same direction. One is uh, from recruiting process. We might speak about that a bit later as well, but uh, designing a recruiting process very early on where it sounds weird because you're like you're three people or five people, uh, they, you can just make very ad hoc decisions. But if you get into this mode of 
kind of patience and and, um, and structure that you you're having this process and these are the steps and everyone has a say in it and this is the role of each in the process and then of course iterating and improving that over time but that helps you from the beginning on be quite clear in hiring decisions and not an early on uh, do the things which are obvious uh, hiring for high bar and not compromising on hiring and saying no if you're in doubt but these kind of things only work if you have the process where you can challenge each other and uh, same goes also with OKRs or goal setting. I, we, I think um, also uh, our CEO Jonas, is, uh, who's driving OKRs at Personio, has very successfully uh, led us to tons of iterations on improving that. And I wouldn't say we're a uh, role model, but I think we're definitely uh, in a good shape when it comes to our goal setting and OKR process and the way we do our OKR affairs internally and so on. However, when sometimes people ask me, with 90, 100, or 200 people, hey, we're now, we have this problem, can you help us implement OKRs? I have no clue how to do it at a 200 people organization and change all the thing. I think that's really hard, but what's really easy is, at five people, start with your OKRs, even if it's awkward presenting to the other four people your OKRs, but doing these kind of simple things early on, why they're simple, and then just growing them with the organization and constantly iterating on them. And that goes with both organization, hiring, um, goal setting, and a ton of other examples. Okay. Thanks for sharing them. I'd actually love to go through them um, even more in depth because I think we have a lot of founders, maybe people thinking about founding a company on this call. Um, so I think even like diving a, uh, like a level deeper into that will be really, really um, beneficial for that. So what I understood is you have um, sort of on the building of your organization side, you've clearly defined your purpose. And you have your B hack that might actually require some explanation. I know it's your, your big, hairy, audacious goal. So maybe you can actually um, explain these two components, how you work with them, how they're interlinked. And then the third layer, I think, was the missions or team missions. Um, just like if somebody would like to actually do has like a startup with five people and would like to implement these three components, maybe we can even make them more tangible. How did you define them? How do you actually use them on like an ongoing basis? Yeah. I'm happy to share how we're doing it, um, but just as a disclaimer, I think it doesn't matter as much which exact framework you choose or how, whether you call it BHAG or vision or mission or whatever, but I think it matters that you get to you find one, you can even make some up uh, for yourself, but that you have one which is clearly communicated and understood within the organization. And for example, for us, the structure looks as follows. We have our core purpose, which is the reason we exist and which we'll always try for but never really reach. Mm -hmm. Then we have our strategic vision, which is essentially defining how we will execute on our core purpose over the next 10 years. Still a long time horizon, but already a bit more concrete. And then we have the BHAG, which is our big hairy audacious goal, which defines uh, a measurable way how, when we have defined, uh, when we have, uh, or whether we, which is a measurable artifact which allows us to measure whether we're making progress towards our strategic vision and our core purpose. That's very technical, but that's how we define it internally. And then we just spend um, an entire weekend discussing and making workshops uh, back in 2016, finding out what, what are we actually here to do and, and what are we striving to, to achieve with this company. And then we've, we've adopted not on the core purpose, but the strategic vision and BHAG, we adopted some wordings, but essentially the, the essence has, has been the same. And of course, that just requires a lot of discussion with, with your co-founders and, and the early team of, of what you're actually here to build. When it comes to, um, to the, the missions element, I think it's just <clears throat> important to, as mentioned, I think this way of looking at the customer lifecycle makes sense because essentially every company is there to serve a customer and to make this customer successful. Um, and therefore, uh, figuring out what do we need to, to do that is, is really important uh, or, or isn't valid strategy. I think there's others. Um, but when it comes to then, uh, I think it's, it also, again, doesn't matter how exactly you then structure the teams. It just is important that you really, that you create them in a messy way. That's a bit consulting talk. I've never been in consultancy, but I've been, been taught that. Um, but it's um, that, that they're mutually exclusive but collectively exhaustive so that you don't have overlap because one thing that where these missions really help for example is when we in the management team still today have a discussion around hey we have this problem around i don't know customer um, marketing and this is now a customer success team, uh, topic or a marketing topic and then if we look at, at the, the missions and we say okay what's the outcome of them it's new leads because we want to generate referrals then it's a then it's a 
a marketing topic. It's about educating the customers and making them successful in the product and marketing the product into them. And then it's a customer success topic because they have those different missions. And I think that's just uh, where it, it helps you and that's the mutually exclusive. So they shouldn't be um, overlapping. So it's clear that if you have a project or topic you want to assign to one team, that you know where to assign it to and collectively exhaust this just means that there shouldn't be anything coming up and you know oh, who is responsible for that because it doesn't fit a mission as said then you can of course over time this will always happen you can create new missions you can uh, continue to to evolve your organization but it also like i think one of the big benefits it have, have allowed us to do is despite the growth to now 450 people we never had to reorg the company which is a very painful structure, and I don't even know how to do it because we've never done it. But um, I think we we were able to always adapt and, and evolve our organization, but we always had a clear understanding. We even have something what we call um, our organizational map, which is just a Google slide where every new joiner can go in and view, and we also have a presentation for that, but uh, then uh, can view in, okay, this is the different teams, these are their missions, this is the different roles in there, that's the mission of those roles, and so on, and therefore you just create a lot of transparency also for people coming new into the organization. Who should I talk to when it's about X? Very cool. So, sounds sounds um, like we can all uh, very much learn from that. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And maybe before we jump to recruiting, let's maybe um, focus on the third topic you mentioned, OKR. So you have defined sort of like the more co consistent ownership and transparency um, with the team and role missions. Um, what role do the OKRs then play Um yeah, so I think the, the organizational structure and the missions, at least for us, create the guidance. Mm -hmm. um, the OKRs have three uh, benefits. So one, uh, they definitely they help um, each individual in the company to link their daily work with the company's strategic vision and the BHAG. So essentially, if we do our job well, and I always tell new joiners that if they ever feel that this is not the case, they should reach out to me because then we don't do our job well. But we have company OKRs, um, and then we have department OKRs, and then we have team OKRs if the departments are big enough that they have several sub teams. And um, essentially, each person working at Personio should uh, their, their work should contribute to their team or department OKRs and through that cascade up to the company OKRs and the company OKRs should of course be the, our best guess for what we need to do this year um, to uh, achieve our BHAG and hence this is number one connection towards the BHAG. Mm -hmm. Number two is uh, that uh, we have a uh, that we have a easable measurable way of whether we're making progress and whether we're, we're working on the right thing and we can, can actually uh, achieve something and know okay we're working in the right direction and uh, and also create focus within the uh, within the teams to make sure that um, we're, we're not doing tons of different things and don't know what we're doing but we're actually aligning this qu quarter is about these three things and we are going about them and la the third one is about uh, transparency and that's uh, where it comes all OKRs are public we have a quarterly uh, OKR fair where in a like fair or yeah, uh, well, trade fair format. Uh, there's different booths for each department where they present the new uh, OKRs and they, they make videos about them and then people can watch them and inform themselves and walk around, have a beer and drinks and uh, figure out what the others are doing. And then we have a review uh, once a month about where we stand on the OKRs and of course the same with the company OKRs. And essentially, so this connection to the to the vision, um, uh, tr uh, focus on what, we, what actually matters and transparency, I feel are sort of the the three big things that um, where OKRs can help us, um, uh, and yeah, why we why we use them. Perfect. Thanks for sharing that. And um, while you were talking, I realized you guys are using OKRs. We're using OKRs. Part of Leaps is actually an OKR tool, but maybe you should actually give one introductory sentence of what OKRs actually are, because for some people that might have been a lot of like abbreviations. So do you mind just like in, a, in just two sentences that we don't lose anyone who was like confused yeah. by what we're even talking about, what, what OKRs even are. Yeah, so OKRs in one sentence are stand for objective and key results, and essentially they're just a framework for, for goal setting and for measuring progress, um, where the objectives define what uh, you want to achieve uh, in a more um, product term or a more um, 
qualit uh, qualitative and uh, in a quantitative way the key results measure whether you're making progress on that. And um, yeah, so feel free, uh, everyone who's interested, read more about that um, online. Uh, but I think, or try leap some for, for managing them. Uh, but I think uh, what, what really matters, just one learning out of thousands which we made along the way, uh, one thing that really matters uh, for objectives, in my opinion, is setting them in an output driven way. Uh, ideally, even outcome driven, but I'm not going into the <laughs> numeric details about it. But uh, that you really don't, uh, um, so you want to empower people still with these OKRs. Okay, they're, they're mainly button, set bottom up anyway, but to give one example, an input driven OKR for marketing would be, we want to do 10 webinars this quarter. And then the marketing team starts to do their 10 webinars uh, and, and after webinar four, they might realize that, uh, that they have, uh, that the webinars don't have any impact. And then they either um, uh, uh, stop doing them, and they, but they, then they have no chance of uh, of reaching their goals anymore. Or even worse, they continue doing them despite not having any impact. And hence, a good output-driven OKRs, in which we always try to challenge each other on all levels when we set OKRs, um, uh, is that you would say in this example, generate 200 leads, just making up a random number this quarter by premium content or some more video content, whatever. So it's broad enough that it gives a clear guidance what we focus on and maybe webinars is the right structure and they, they work on them and they generate 300 OK, uh, leads and that's great. Or they figure out of the third webinar that's a bad idea and then they have, they're still empowered to um, try to find new ways to reach their goals and they, they're not in this kind of funnel thinking. Thank you for clarifying that. And actually, you don't even have to start using Leapsum immediately. There's great free resources on our website that help you also get started. Um, and maybe on a side note uh, to that, obviously, we love you starting Leapsum as well. <laughs> um, in terms of the second dimension you initially mentioned, uh, recruiting and hiring, I think that's also like a really interesting one. And obviously, a lot of companies uh, have been complaining in the past couple of years of how hard it actually is to find the right people. So this is might actually be one of the huge constraints to growth these days. Like money seems to be abundant, people aren't. Um, so I'd love to hear how you tackled that challenge. And um, maybe also, as you said, like you initially had um, a founding team that was diverse in terms of um, sort of like backgrounds, or um, sort of like functional backgrounds, maybe uh, to squeeze in a second question there so you can <laughs> answer them together. How have you also paid any particular attention to diversity while, while hiring or recruit and recruiting? Yeah. Um, yeah, so let me start with the first one around recruiting in general. So, yes, recruiting is hard. And for everyone in the early stage uh, that thinks it gets easier, unfortunately it doesn't uh, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, but while initially like, it's just really hard for different reasons at different stages, initially it was really hard because no one knows you, you don't have a brand, you, people don't even know whether you're going to be around tomorrow. So who, how do you convince people to even go after you plus like any recruiting tools or job postings are really expensive and if you only want to hire one person and then you out of the many job boards picking one to post there and maybe you, you, you're lucky but maybe you're not so it's there's a ton of reasons why it's hard in the beginning a lot of these things which i just mentioned get easy over time and i always hope that thereby also recruiting gets easier but then you have completely different challenges i mean we are we are just pre-corona pre at least we've been hiring 30 people a month so you have um, a much larger funnel to manage. Um, you have to uh, to manage that you, uh, probably to, uh, from my time, certainly 40% of the time was spent recruiting, but also in the organization. You don't want to slow down your entire organization because they're all recruiting. So I think there's a ton of uh, challenges that come with it. And I think in the last year we had, uh, or last 12 months, we had 25,000 candidates, which we had to, to process through the funnel uh, to then hire, I think, around 240. And uh, so there's... There's all these challenges that come with it over time, so unfortunately it doesn't get easier. Um, that said, I think to, to mention a few learnings, um, I don't have a silver bullet, so when it comes to channels or where you get hires from, just do everything. So you, we do post on job boards, we do a ton of active sourcing, we even have, uh, we have a ton of events and we do employer branding and you have to do everything, so there's no, oh, I'm just gonna do that and I'm going to fix it. 
I'm not a big fan of Headhunter. I'm a big fan of internal recruiters. We very early on hired our first, uh, well, way too late, but uh, earlier than others, we hired our first recruiter. And uh, since we were now a team of, of 20 recruiters internally, and uh, I'm a big fan of that because they can work closely with the, with the teams rather than headhunters. The only way where we, uh, the only place where we use uh, external recruiters is for uh, senior, senior level um, hires. I think that's, you also won't get around because they have the much better network there. Um, but outside of that, yeah, recruiting process makes a ton of sense, use all channels. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think the, the one thing that really matters is be very deliberate on not making any compromises. And it's super hard because as you mentioned, your growth will be, uh, will be kind of uh, hindered. And our growth was hindered a lot of times due to rec uh, recruiting and your especially if you raise a lot of money, your investor is going to push you to, to actually spend it and, and, and invest it into growth. But then you may, may mostly you need people for that. And if you can't hire them at a fast enough pace, it hinders your growth. But nevertheless, I think the, the most long-term successful and enduring companies do not compromise on recruiting. And hence, especially you as a founder who are the ultimate, who should be the ultimate person that, that is interested in the long-term success of the company should always and be somewhat unbiased and detached from local heads that need their team to be staffed um, and uh, therefore I still today hire every person in a founder interview in the end and still around 30% um, are uh, then um, declined based on also partially my judgment but also everyone else in the process and if I um, and if I uh, which and the reason is is not that anyone before me has a better, a worse judgment than me, but just a lot of people are biased. They need their colleague to help them. They need their person on the team because it's really urgent and there's a lot of work to do. And uh, of course, after the, when we have some, some roles which we didn't staff after 90 candidates uh, or, or 200 candidates, and, uh, and then people get frustrated and they say, okay, like this person is okay, let's just get it over the line. And that's why you have to just be really strict, um, as, as stupid as it sounds. Um, and then to your second question around diversity, um, we were a, a somewhat diverse founder team. One of my co-founders is from Russia, and we uh, we had all the different study programs. No, but nevertheless, we are all uh, white male, similar age, um, so not <laughs> quite a diverse team in the beginning. And I think it's hard to also uh, optimize for diversity from day one. Um, but I think you you should quite early on uh, work on diversity by uh, first of all because it like if it, even if you don't agree with all the studies which i would fully do uh, that diversity adds benefits to the team and you'll get better decisions and better input and so on but even just very practically you also get to hire from a much bigger talent pool because if you're not a diverse team no one that with diverse backgrounds will join your team so for example making the company language english from day one and having uh, there might be able to hire internationally where we by now have 45 different nationalities, uh, which quite quickly build up. And uh, also, I mean, it's partially dom domain specific, whether it's harder or um, less hard to attract uh, different genders, uh, but we always had a roughly 50-50 ratio across the entire company. Um, we also were decent on leadership positions where we weren't very good as on the, on the management because it was like us founders and then some early hires which we made. And that's where we made also a deliberate effort working with these headhunters in the past, and we had some uh, female talent on that level already, but now uh, as we established our C-level team, uh, where we just added a few people into it, I told every headhunter which, uh, that in the contract they should write a clause that the shortlist needs to be 50-50 male-female, so not somewhere up in the funnel, but really down at the final candidates. And we ended up hiring our CFO, Birgit, and our CRO, Geraldine, um, both two female uh, candidates, which were by far the best candidates of the process. But, uh, but it's likely that if we hadn't forced contractually the headhunter to actually bring in uh, and search really hard for also female talent, we might have never found them and then would have uh, hired a, a male candidate that would be sub hard to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, putting emphasis on it early on just makes ton, ton of sense on a lot of levels. And for senior hires, you're paying those headhunters a ton of money. So make sure it's also important to do the right diverse funnel. 
thanks for sharing that. And uh, what I took away is definitely always you, you interview every single candidate, the final interviews. I think that's uh, that's really, really inspiring. And that's a great tip on um, um, putting diversity into the contracts of your headhunters. And I think then something um, that's also exciting is um, you have open three new uh, locations. So you are also internationalizing. Um, so if I'm correct, it's Madrid, London and Dublin. And I think some of that was also through acquisition, which actually probably generates a whole additional complexity. So how has your experience been sort of like moving from being mainly Munich based to having four locations integrating sort of like other companies into into Personio? Uh, what can we all learn from that experience? It comes with a ton of challenges that we're still uh, learning every day. Um, I think let, let me start with, with a chronological order uh, with Madrid because uh, that was the first office we had outside of Munich uh, given that we made this acquisition there um, early in 2019 um, of, a, of a payroll um, startup to, which we integrate now with Personio um, or have as part of Personio. I think the benefit we had with this acquisition was that it was a highly synergetic product so they were built as a back-end api first payroll uh, solution to plug in into solutions like ourselves so there was nothing where we had to come in and uh, fire uh, or d discard a product or fire people so we could take over the entire team also because they didn't really have a sales team they were a fully tech focused team so we're just plugging into our product and engineering organization nevertheless of course it was also a three-year-old startup. It was 25 people. They all had their own culture. They all had their identity. And um, and it was in Madrid with uh, the diff all the cultural difference, but also just the locational difference. I think the, the biggest challenge, and I had gotten that input from a lot of people up front, but it was just really hard still to execute well on it, is um, to make sure that you always think of these people as well. Like if you're... Uh, when you're doing an all-team meeting, making sure that, that everyone, we do that every Friday, making sure that everyone can participate Even back then. Now it seems obvious with Zoom, but back then making sure all of these things are set up properly, that it's a, a good experience for them also to participate and not just, okay, they can somehow listen in. Also same with all meetings, that you make a default that there's always a Zoom, me, a Zoom meet link in the calendar uh, that you uh, think of them when you do team events, uh, how to, can you make sure that they can participate uh, or have their own events. So I think there's a ton of things where it's just about having that in mind that you're now on two locations and with every decision you take. I think that's a, a, a very tricky one and one which we regular still get wrong, but I think we're getting better on it. Um, now, um, the benefit, however, was that also the founder uh, of that company stayed on board and we had a very uh, had a very close connection. So that person also helped bridge uh, this kind of these two teams and these two offices. And uh, we now really also make sure that it's not an encapsulated one, but we have the team work close together that some uh, people from there report also into people in Munich. And uh, I'm spending uh, pre-corona and hopefully soon again, one uh, one week a month in Madrid as well, a couple of days at least to uh, to be there in person, to moderate an all-team meeting from there as well, so that our colleagues from Munich also uh, have to listen in to, to, that, um, to the same experience. And um, then uh, I think it was a bit different with, with London, uh, mainly because London was then a completely a new team that were also was hired where we did bring people in for three months into Munich but still then they're there by themselves by themselves they don't have any experience uh, any knowledge about the, uh, the tool and it's of course much harder to just ask across the desk than to write someone on Slack or jump on a Zoom call for a minor thing but I definitely uh, realized that when I spent some time with the team there that there was a huge uh, gap in knowledge on, on a couple of processes and tools and so on which is very hard to bridge initially so therefore there my learning which we got wrong for uh, sure is always send also existing people of the team that know the company the tools the product and so on really well into these new offices and that's what we're now trying to do better with dublin where we have um Sheldon, the new cro uh, opening up the office but we're also looking and bringing people from the existing team to the dublin office to make sure that it's not just new people and they can bring the transport the culture and uh, the knowledge over as well mm -hmm. 
All right. Thank you for sharing that. And um, uh, you already mentioned um, that uh, sort of the COVID-19 situation has impacted you in the sense that you can't travel to Madrid anymore. Your team um, are working in a home office. What about your customer side? Have you seen sort of like significant changes in sort of like what your customers are asking you for? Have you even like adapted your products and sort of launched certain products that help your customers during these times or anything that you see sort of like major changes that impact how you work or how you, what your product does these days? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, clearly our customers uh, being HR, um, or the main main customers being HR people, they they of course are have been heavily impacted by the crisis and heavily had to do the heavy lifting of all these changes and all the uh, sort of taking care of employees remotely, setting up home office and so on. And um, luckily, a lot of the things we do in our tool and digitizing these processes, of course, helps with a, a couple of these things early on. Requesting uh, home office. Oh, am I stuck or? I can still hear you're frozen for a second, but I can still hear your voice. So I think we're we're good. Frozen for a second. Um, yeah. So uh, our customers are heavily involved in this whole change, and um, our tool can certainly support on a couple of angles when it comes to um, remote hiring, re uh, remote onboarding, um, requesting home office, and a lot of the things which we already did, and of course also the just practical thing that having. The HR data digitalized rather than in the back in the office where no one is today. I think all of these, of course, helped. Um, but we did also make some changes around um, how we help customers um, track short time, uh, so Kurzarbeit in German, where uh, a lot of people had um, yeah implemented short time and uh, helping uh, those uh, companies with their payroll and providing them uh, with these specific uh, tools um, to, to properly track that. Also the attendance tracking for employees, which you are required to do by law. And a ton of these things, um, we made some tweaks to the products and we, we also um, uh, offered some of these tools of Pisonio for free also to companies that have been um, impacted and required it. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you for also sharing that. I actually have three sort of like rapid fire short answer question I would, I would love to um, ask you. Then we're going to jump into the Q&A soon. So maybe first question as you, um, your own employees development um, is very important to, to you. Um, how do you go about that? Um, and I think what's really cool, at least from the outside, it looks like some companies just always bring in more senior people, whereas you seem to have developed like a lot of internal talent as well. How did you achieve that and how you continue to achieve that? Yeah, um, yeah I'm trying to be quick. Uh, one, one, of course, our HR team is heavily involved in into employee development, uh, but also we, we try to uh, give a lot of ownership to people by, by, for example, having a development budget for each individual where they can just choose where they want to invest uh, their time and all the uh, money into. Um, and I think uh, it just, I mean, in a startup environment, people can grow quite quickly, but of course you have to still um, manage that growth of people that you don't overload because for example you, you can have someone that, that joins as potentially head of sales or some whatever title uh, with a small team and then uh, you have to, to always look at are they the scaling in the right pace are they, and not just assuming okay, if you, even if you want to develop someone internally make sure you, you keep them on the right growth trajectory because if the company grows so fast and you realize that uh, that they are not or cannot stay on that growth trajectory you, you don't have to fire them or hire someone else uh, yeah, but you uh, can find roles for them that uh, where they can grow very fast with the company but stay on the right trajectory without uh, being burned out and then uh, having to leave the company because they're failing in a role that's that's getting too big for them so i think always having this this trade of in mind is this person ready to take the next step or do we f find a role that's still of course growing extremely fast but maybe not uh, into that direction Perfect. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then the sort of like second sort of like short answer question, what are your personal top three learnings from this crazy journey over the last five years? So I would say one, one learning I mentioned before uh, that you implement a ton of things that sound very simple, but very early on because they are, get a lot harder over time. Um, 
I think, secondly, it's, uh, I would say, uh, my, my uh, one big learning is about pu pulling myself out early on and, and tr trusting people. I mean, it's a very easy management learning, but one uh, which which took me <laughs> then took me a while to really uh, make sure that I'm not jumping into things anymore just because I have an opinion or idea, but let people grow and think uh, figure stuff out themselves. And thirdly, I think one that just came uh, very uh, like now in the last couple of months, people uh, on the team and your uh, and your colleagues often have a, a much lower tolerance uh, towards uncertainty than you have. And as a founder, you typically like to be in uncertainty, especially in times like the last couple of weeks where things are very uncertain. It's your role to also create as much stability and certainty to them as you can, and uh, because they have a, might have a much lower tolerance over certainty. And even if you don't know, of course, you can't predict the future, but if you can say, this is the kind of cost reductions or whatever we're doing right now and we're re-evaluating that in three weeks and by these three KPIs depending how they change this already gives much more certainty than just say oh, yeah, uh, we're now going into short time but we don't know what's changing and I think yeah, adding that certainty to people was an important learning from the last couple of weeks. So being very clear and transparent and specific sort of like in your, your communication. Yeah, uh, all, all great learnings for us. And I think sometimes uh, to your second point, the ones that sound the easiest sometimes are the hardest uh, for, for founders. Um, and uh, sort of like my final question before we open up to the audience uh, for Q&A, and I think you can actually um, already um, deliver your, sort of submit your questions. Um, so final question from my end would be, what's next for Personio? Where do you want to take this? I mean, there's a lot of work to do. So our BHAG is uh, becoming a category leading uh, HR as recruiting and payroll solution for SMEs in Europe. And uh, while we have over 2000 customers by now, there's millions of SMEs, so a, lot of way, a long way to go. We also think we can uh, build and continue to be an independent company, so we are, have no plans of selling the company, but eventually taking it public. Um, but uh, along the way, I think well, currently there's a lot of internationalization happening, um, of course a lot of work on product, which we can still do and expand for, so a very exciting road we ever had also for this year and the next couple of years. And yeah, lastly, of course, continuing to hire a lot of smart talent uh, into the organization to help us achieve these things. It sounds very exciting. And I think we're all like uh, very happy to see you succeeding and building like a, a European category leader in the space. So uh, sounds amazing. Um, thank you for sharing all these insights. I would have tons of additional questions for you, but I want to make sure that everybody else also gets a chance to ask questions. So I think Charlotte is going to, um, go ahead and, and start uh, going through questions. Thanks, Anno. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, both. So we have some questions from the audience um, from Slido. Thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. They were all very interesting. We've um, selected four to ask you very quickly. Um, so the first is, how do you get the buy-in from all employees to put the work in for the OKR process? How often does Personio do the OKR fair? Um, we actually never really had a problem with, with buy-in organization. I think, once again, this is something, if you do it from the beginning on, everyone is excited about it and everyone has to buy-in. Um, but uh, I think still, if I, if I would think what, what generates buy-in uh, is, of course, uh, that people are involved in the discussions and decisions of what are we tackling, even for the company OKRs, which run on an annual basis for our company strategy. We run a very inclusive process. We make clear it's not a democratic process. Strategy is not about uh, raising hands who wants to do what, but uh, gathering input from everyone, collecting that input and then making a decision about strategy and presenting and also present what we're not going to do and, and the reasons behind it. Uh, and to your second question, uh, how often do we do OKR fairs? So our OKR cycles for the department and teams run on a um, quarterly basis. And hence, on every last Friday in the old quarter, we make an OKR fair presenting the, the next quarter's OKR, which is now coming up next Friday again. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and the next question, how do you approach internationalization? Who leads the new market and what is their profile? Is it a marketing profile or a sales profile? Um, 
So we first had a uh, head of international uh, who has a sales profile um, who is now transitioned into country manager UK, given that it's a big market for us as well, and he's still leading some of the, the specific expansion, but, but also focusing down on, on UK. And then we have um, for Nordics, Benelux, and uh, Spain, um, also more sales-focused leaders for the different markets. And then, um, of course, our chief revenue officer who combines sales and marketing. And within marketing, we also have regional marketing managers to support with that. Um, but the ones on the ground and in the teams for us are salespeople. Thank you. And the next question, how do you select markets that you want to expand to? What is the key criteria that you follow? Are you following an academic approach or an opportunistic approach? I would say both. So first of all, we spent quite some time on an analysis and the criteria where size of the market, uh, degree of digitization, um, size of the market includes also number of SMEs, so how's the structure of the economy there, um, and then uh, uh, readiness of the market, so how many competitors are there already and how, much, how far is this market developed. Um, and then among a, a couple and willingness to pay, I think was one other and a couple of smaller ones. Then we did rank markets by that and by that potential, and then had a, had a discussions around it. And that's also how we picked them. But then we at the same time also uh, act opportunistically because there's also of course inbound coming in. France currently hasn't been a focus market yet. We always knew we wanted to go there eventually, but not in the short term. And now we're seeing a lot of deals coming in all of a sudden uh, from a couple of referrals. There are some happy customers. Um, and so we, we might go into France much quicker than we initially planned. So yeah, it's a mix between academic to understand the markets and then opportunistic whenever there's opportunity to go after it. And um, the last question, how did, you secure, um, how did you secure first customers specifically how did you convince them to implement this innovative tool? What was the sales cycle? I mean, it's really tough to measure sales cycle early on when, when you as a, uh, as a founder running around, and that's exactly what it was right now. Selling to SMEs, of course, we're mainly selling with web demos and video calls from the office. Uh, back then, if you were a three-person startup, of course, no one trusts buying something for you over the phone. So uh, I went to companies in person, uh, mainly in the bigger cities, but in Hamburg, Munich, went from door to door from different companies and where I tried to, through my network get, or elsewhere, get introductions to. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and then the sales cycle sometimes were really quick because they were just willing to try it. Um, sometimes for some it took longer. Um, I would say probably right now our sales cycle is six weeks on average. Um, of course, can be one week for a small deal and can be three months for a bigger one. Um, and back then, probably was somewhere in a similar scale. Perfect. Thank you so much. So that concludes our fireside chat. Um, Jenny and Hanno, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really insightful conversation. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Great. And thank you, everyone, for um, joining at home. So this was, a, again, a really insightful conversation about how do we grow and scale our companies, how do we recruit talent, and how do we support their growth. So thank you. I hope you've learned something. And um, if you want to attend another event, if you want to learn more about us, you can read more at factoryberlin.com. Thank you. Have a good evening. Hi, guys. <laughs>